Thus, the behavior of Libanius in, the, uh, in front of a, a statue of a divinity, where he tried to palliate his pains, follows a new protocol of attitudes established uh, for, from imperial uh, law. Even though this is the norm, that does not mean that this norm could be followed in the same manner uh, in all the territories of the Imperium. Another form of interaction is the one that results in conflicts and destruc destruction of the statues. In this particular, one of the most documented events in late antiquity is without doubt the uh, rising of the statues in Antioch in the year 387 b uh, of this era. Referenced to the imperial images uh, that because of the imposition of a new tribute, the population of Antioch, led by the municipal elite, the Boleutas, mocked and destroyed. Theodosius, the emperor, uh, the target of the attacks, applied a lay of majestas in, in all of his principles, destituted the city of Antioch of, her, of, of its statues of metropolis, uh, closes the, the, the baths and public s or important public spaces of interaction, and applied the capital penalty against the, the mutineers in the, suppress the immediate suppression of the conflict. The evidence, the evidence uh, coming from the writings of Libanius in def uh, defending the temples highlights two important elements. First, that the, the preoccupation of the Sophists with the statue of Asclepius in Beroea, Beroea is Beroea, related with the danger that destru of destructions that could happen in the rural zone of Antioch. Secondly, the preoccupation with the description of the statue and his, its appearance. Um, the artistic style was connected with the political interest of identifying these objects as character of, of universal acceptance uh, on an, a common terrain uh, between Christians and pagans for its value for the construction of, of identity as men of Paideia. In the case of the destruction of As Asclepius, uh, this example is associated, according to Perry, to the, uh, to the straight identification, the close identification, between this god as a miraculous god, attracting several <laughs> followers, including Christians, that tried to solve personal crises or sufferings and infirmities. In this sense, the destruction of the statues of gods, heroes, and personifications is related with uh, uh, a space of dispute, uh, the rural zone, uh, as an important zone of Christian uh, uh, acting, and with the appearance of the statue that could evoke representations and virtues imagined from uh, important personalities of Christian history, and therefore would also attract groups of Christians that uh, would cult, uh, pr give cult to it in a clear movement of transgression of religious frontiers that would put in check Christian identity uh, th as, it, as seen by the so-called church fathers. The statues of gods, heroes, and personifications in a religious context would be dangerous and therefore would be necessary a strategy of desacralization and preservation <coughs> of the monuments in a pagan pers perspective, <coughs> or a preservation with a pedagogical end on a Christian's point of view. The rituals of divine and imperial cult needed the presence of some mechanisms and ornaments. All this contributes to create a, co a, a, a scene of contact with the divine and the celestial world. The presence of the altar against the imperial images is conceived in a Christian perspective with uh, something that would represent the, the recognition of great uh, acts and not connected with the offering of sacrifices. Even though there might be also the possibility that, that emperors were uh, subject to cult with sacrifices, as we can see from the statues of Constantine. And... Uh, the imperial statues were, aggr were aggregated or put together with an altar, like the mosaic of Iatko that we've seen. The topographic border of the Iatko 
Yak to Mosaic, is in, we can observe the presence of three statues erected in a, in a square where there is a great tree after the scene of two players. According to the description of Lassus, it is a statue of an emperor with military clothing, with, coras, with uh, leather uh, protection and paludamentum on a high pedestal and followed by an entourage, the two other statues located in a lower pedestal uh, with the presence of imação. Imation. Imation. Signs of authority that could be representations of mm -hmm. high rank uh, functionaries mm -hmm. or, or officers. In Antioch, mm -hmm. according to textual <laughs> evidence, uh, John Malalas, Libanio, John Chrysostom, the imperial statues were located in the interior mm -hmm. of the city. Um, uh, away, it seems, from spaces like uh, mountains and elevated regions. In these spaces, there are two marked relevance extracted from the Chronicle of John Malalas, referring to the statue of Medea in Mont Silpio, and one of Orestes from Greek mythology, son of Clim yeah. Clymnestra, um, put in a space facing Mont Armano, Amanus, according to Catherine, Catherine Salieu, and thus, uh, uh, it indicates that these would be spaces also of disposition of divine statues of heroes and mythological figures. In material culture, another space is presented to us of the villa, the domestic space, residential space. And contrary to what we have, wha what has been proposed with uh, desacralization in favor of a comprehension of this group of sculptures as art, we argue that the statues of gods, heroes, and personifications, in Antioch at least, still re uh, play an important role in a system of Roman beliefs in late antiquity. Uh, new strategies were created showing uh, st uh, a strength, uh, remaining strength and vitality of a traditional resilient Roman culture, and its vitality receives new share. Uh, uh, shapes or new forms of interpretation. The imperial images on their <laughs> turn uh, <coughs> enlarge their spaces of, uh, of uh, acting, including themselves, in everyday Antiochian life and also promoting a, par a particular sacrality that ascends the Im imperial images to status of divinities, numen sometimes to status of sacred uh, sacrality. Thus, this conception and division of the political segregated from religious is only apparent. The imperial statues would be, in our opinion, also objects of sacrality and divinity, presenting, however, important particularities. In the intersection between the political and the religious, the imperial images erected in a urban space uh, inhabiting the streets of Antioch and living day by day with the Antiochians does not imply conceiving these images only in the light of a political uh, area, since their spaces of disposition only at first can be considered solely political spaces. This ambiguity can still be reinforced if we consider the evidence present in John Malalas, where a statue of Constantine the First, there was sculpted in metal from the reuse of the bronze of a Poseidon statue that was found during the constructions of an inn in Antioch. The statue of Poseidon, according to Malalas, worked as a talisman for the protection of the city, was melted down and transformed in a statue of Constantine that was erected in front of the Praetorium. With this reuse, Constantine would uh, uh, house the divinity in his, uh, the sacred and material divinity coming from Poseidon. Therefore, to, con to finish, uh, this collection from Antioch invites us to know and reflect what is 
the statue in the space of the villa or domus, which would be villa, 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 space of the villa, not only as art, but as images, potentially target of cult, reverence, and defense from a world order, order where emperors and divinities are still vivid in the eyes of those who visit Antioch between the 4th and 5th centuries. And perhaps, who knows, this case study could in, any, in some way stimulate um, uh, an examination in of Cicero's case in his villa, since religion is an important part of this great hom Roman character. And thus, we can think uh, of the material constitution of his own villa in the light of religion, and not only as pieces of an artistic ornamentation. So. Obrigada, Erika. Obrigada, Su. Eu abro, então, para questões. Regina. Não, não é muito bem em contexto funerário. Na verdade, é, é, eu coloquei é, sepulcro, né? mas não é. Eles enterraram para esconder as estátuas, na verdade. É um contexto de proteção, então. Não, não é. Não, não. Prote... é. é, eu botei sepulcro, mas ó, não, não, não. É porque eu não achei a palavra específica. Pra... Mas não é em contexto funerário, não. É, eu vou ter que mudar. Eu agradeço, Érica. Muito obrigada. E isso. E para a gente ir adiante, Federico, por favor. Obrigada, Érica. Eu corri um pouco para a gente, por causa da hora, tá? A gente tem o um horário, mas... Então, é, nós vamos passar agora e o, para o paper, para a leitura... Ah, pode deixar, pode deixar. Para a leitura do paper da, de Catherine East... Uh, da Universidade de Newcastle, que não pôde vir, infelizmente, mas veio, o Federico trouxe seu paper, e ele vai fará, fará a leitura, agora é o Rio PowerPoint, não? Sim. Yes. Ok. É do texto da Catherine, uh -huh. de Newcastle University. University. O título é Editando a Religião de Cícero no Iluminismo. Sim. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my, my colleague, Katie East, can't, can't be here for health reasons. Uh, she, she's doing much better now. Uh, but but she can't be with us um, today. She has uh, sent us her paper. It's a, it's a, mm -hmm. a you know polished version of her paper, which which I'm going to read out um, for you. The, the, there is a PowerPoint, and I shall ask okay. Claudia. If she could no, okay, okay, okay. Yes. Um, the title of uh, uh, of Katie's uh, of Katie's paper is "Editing Ciceronian Religion in the uh, Enlightenment." It's uh, um, um, well. I I'll just start without further ado. Um, with, um, with her introduction. Um, the afterlife of Cicero's thought tends to be sought in the use and interpretation of his words, in the works of those later writers who deployed his legacy to their own ends. The way in which Cicero's words and reputation are cited, presented, integrated into argumentation, selected, characterized and interpreted, provides an endless source of inquiry into the means by which his ideas were received and reinterpreted. There is an additional aspect to this process of engaging with the Ciceronian text, however, which is too often overlooked, as the relationship between the reader of Cicero and Cicero's words is treated as a direct dialogue. In fact, there is fundamentally important, um, a fundamentally important interpretative stage between the ancient author and his reader, i.e. the transmission of the text. This process of transmission encompasses the intervention in the text made by editor, translator, commentator, even printer, and its significance is all too often omitted in studies on the fate of the classical tradition. Cicero's theological dialogues provide a particularly pertinent example of the importance uh, of the process of transmission for two primary reasons. First, the complexity and controversy of the texts themselves, and second, their potential importance to later religious disputes. My own research, um, which I'm currently carrying out um, at Newcastle under a Leverhulme Early Career Fellowship, 
um, is currently examining the uh, combined process of the transmission and reception uh, of Cicero's theological works in early modern England, in particular the early Enlightenment period of the late 17th and early 18th centuries. During this period, Cicero's De Natura Deorum and De Divinatione were invoked in debates centered on the respective arguments for natural and revealed religion, which involved questions of providence, cosmology, the appropriate application of reason to questions of religion, the possibility of prophecies and miracles, the role and necessity of priests, uh, the relationship between church and state, and more. Located in Cicero's works were arguments which could be recruited to serve those arguing both sides of these debates, uh, the ability to claim an authoritative reading of these works, and to locate Cicero's true voice uh, within them, uh, became a central feature of the reception of Ciceronian religion in Enlightenment England. This paper seeks to use this controversy to illustrate how the debates among theologians and philosophers uh, reading Cicero's dialogues were reflected in, perhaps even shaped by, uh, uh, the transmission of those texts. Selectivity is a necessity here, so one facet of these particular Ciceronian texts will be examined, namely the concluding paragraph of Cicero's De Natura Deorum. <coughs> this point in the text was inevitably a focus of discussion among his readers and rarely passed without comment among the scholars tasked with editing or uh, translating the text. In 1713, uh, the conclusion of De Natura Deorum became the focus of a dispute between the radical free thinker Anthony Collins and the orthodox classical scholar Richard Bentley. First, when Collins published his Discourse of Free Thinking, and then when Bentley published his remarks in response to that work. Uh, this exchange centered around Collins' assertion that, quote, by free thinking, then I mean the use of the understanding in endeavoring to find out the meaning of any proposition whatsoever in considering the nature of the evidence for or against it and in judging of it according to the seeming force or weakness of the evidence. Unquote. The controversy emanated from Collins' use of this principle as a tool to diminish the authority of the clergy. The clergy had deliberately confused the matters of religion causing conflicts which could be resolved if men were able to assess religious assertions directly and using their own reason. Um, at the end of, the, of his discourse, Collins produced a catalogue, or a hero's gallery of free thinkers from across history, situating Cicero firmly within that tradition. During his account of Cicero's uh, free thinking ways, Collins refers to the De Natura Deorum as an example of such a methodology, and as a clear example of Cicero's opposition, I don't think so. Well, yeah, but it's later. It becomes relevant later. Uh, a clear example of Cicero's opposition to the theological views of Stoics and Epicureans. Um, I'm quoting again from Collins. Whereas Cicero himself uh, is so far from approving what he makes the Stoic and uh, Epicurean speak, that he does in his discourse of the nature of the gods endeavor to confute all their arguments under the person of an academic of which sect he everywhere professes himself and in his discourse of divination buffers all these stoical arguments for superstition openly under his own name Unquote. here Collins is referring to the structure of the De Natura Deorum and the confusion uh, its structure incited Written as a dialogue, its three books represented the view of the three major philosophical schools on the divine, with Velleius as the spokesperson for Epicureanism in Book 1, Balbus for Stoicism in Book 2, and Cotta for Academic Skepticism in Book 3. Collins argues that any attempt to associate Cicero with the views of the Stoic or Epicurean characters in his books displays a fundamental misunderstanding of the man who had adhered to the academic school of philosophy throughout his life. His personal views, argues Collins, must therefore be identified with the position articulated by the academic skeptic in any of his works, quote, so that Cicero is as unfairly dealt with whenever he is cited against free thinking, as the priests themselves would be, did anyone cite as their sentiments what they make deists 
skeptics and Socinians say in the dialogues they compose against those sects. Unquote. The difficulty for Collins' reading of De Natura Deorum and the challenge raised by Richard Bentley in his remarks lies in the very concluding sentence of the work. At this point in the dialogue, Cicero reappears under his own name, having participated in the discussion primarily as the audience for Velleius, Balbus, and Cotter's exchange of views. Cicero concludes with the following, quote, Here the conversation ended and we parted, Velleius thinking Cotter's discourse to be the truer, while I felt that of Balbus approximated more nearly to a semblance of the truth. Unquote. Surely this amount to Cicero's explicit support for the stoic position on the nature of the gods? Bentley certainly takes it to be so. Quote, when Cicero says above that the stoical doctrine of providence seemed to him more probable, if we take it outright, it carries the same importance as when a stoic says it's certain and demonstrable. For, as I remarked before, the law, the badge, the characteristic of his sect, allowed him to affirm no stronger than that. He durst not have spoken more peremptorily, or peremptorily about a proposition of Euclid or what he saw with his own eyes. His probable had the same influence on his belief, the same force on his life and conduct as the others certain had on theirs. Unquote. For Bentley, the De Natura Deorum is nothing more than an exercise in the academic methodology whereby the different stances on an issue are aired, and it is determined which of the positions is most probable, that key notion in academic skepticism. And the most probable theory, in the view of Cicero himself, is that of the Stoics. Directing this point to Collins, Bentley asks, quote, And what now becomes of our writer's true method and rule? Whatsoever is spoken under the person of an academic, is that to be taken for Cicero's sentiment? Why, Cicero declares here, that he sided with the Stoic against the academic, and whom are we to believe, himself or our silly writer?